Bonjour from Genève, aka the Geneva Motor Show. Hello everyone, my name is Eric. My name, my name is Martin Groschwaltz. <laughs> and we are live from the Geneva Motor Show. 2019 edition Gestalten in full force. In full force and we have actually managed to survive the evening once again. Regular visitors of our podcast and of our sh little show do understand that on the first press day there's usually a party and sometimes we're a little bit damaged from that party but actually like you know we're we're doing all right today and we have to say we were quite surprised with Geneva this year there's a lot of cool things here today or like yesterday as well but we didn't expect that many cool things we were let's say a little bit curious of what's actually going to happen but we've been very pleasantly surprised so far, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, Geneva's always been my favorite show by a long shot. Um, it's just a place for designers that come, you know, from all over the place, neutral territory, really cool cars, um, you know, and really like a place where very wealthy people can come and spend their money. And so there's always some interesting things here to be seen. Um, unlike Martin, I didn't go partying last night. I had a nice Japanese dinner in the city and kept it, <laughs> and kept it civilized. But um, yeah, I mean, most of what it is that is on show here wasn't very much a surprise because, you know, modern day, um, everything's leaking out online, trickling out of information before cars are actually shown and seen. But there were two surprises from Fiat. Um, and you know Alfa Romeo as well so FCA came out and they showed two very cool cars which were none of us were expecting um, and uh, yeah I think they they did a, a very good job with that are we talking about um, the one more producty influenced one which is a Fiat car yes which reminds us or like you know kind of shows us a little bit of the direction of the 500 of the future I would say a little no, bit. No, it's it's it's, uh, it's it's more a Panda remake. So it's called the the it's called the Senti Senti Venti, I think. Yes, um, Senti Venti, 120 in Italian. Um, it's very significant for the brand, celebrating 120 years and so forth. I suppose. Um, but anyway, what is interesting about that car is yes, it's a very diff interesting product-oriented approach, but it's a modern day. Uh, Panda and everybody loves the mm -hmm. Panda in Italy certainly um, the Panda in terms of uh, you know Gijaro's you know initial vehicle was hugely successful and I think um, everybody's been kind of chasing that so how do you reinvent that for you know modern day and I, I think they did a good job with this uh, you know some some cool ideas some things like you know 3d printed you know um, things for the interior but I, obviously the most uh, the part of that vehicle that references, in my opinion, the Panda the most is the IP um, and the way that, you know, there's various different places to store certain things um, and integrate certain elements. It also has a little bit of a, of a Opal Junior touch mm -hmm. because of, you know, the fact that there's all these kind of um, different uh, elements and it's modular and, um, you know, the, the, the fact that you can take out the front seat and put in a little child seat. So a lot of really cool little ideas and certainly for a future Panda very uh, very nice. So I was pleasantly surprised by very that. Very progressive certainly. for Fiat as well. I think we've seen a little bit more of the conservative side from them in the past and like more like an, an evolution rather than a, a revolution. And this one is definitely showcasing the first idea of electric vehicles for them. You know, obviously for the, uh, let's say Fiat Chrysler group itself electric vehicles took a little bit of time mm. so this is a, a very very big kind of push forward um, in, in, in my personal opinion and uh, obviously going alongside with that was the Alpha um, yes. that, that came fully electric as well so the first fully electric Alpha concept I think it was it's not a production car yet it's a, it is no. a concept yeah I don't I don't know about like electrification I mean to be honest I wasn't really looking at that I, I was just looking at it from you know it's more of an evolution for Alfa Romeo, but C-segment crossovers are massively important and they certainly need one. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's a good next vehicle to get into the Q range of cars. 
Um, so, you know, tonale, as it's called, is, uh, it's, it's nice, um, you know, and, and there are some, again, Jajaro references within that car, um, certainly from a Brera perspective with the very long, you know, three mm -hmm. um, headlamps and the tail lamp signature as well. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a nice car. I was pleasantly surprised by both, both of those cars. And uh, I think just to, to say this out loud, I mean, Geneva is usually the most packed show. So we see a lot of new reveals here. We see a lot of new concept cars. So it will be absolutely impossible for us to talk about all of them, especially because there's so many one-off companies nowadays or like supercar companies and all these kind of things. And some of them are absolutely horrible. Like, you know, we've been just wandering around to kind of get this last impression of, of all these companies. And I mean, we were holding our head at some point and it's like, what is this? What, what is this? You know, why, why are people doing this? But uh, apparently there is a market for it. But let's talk more about the, the traditional one. Let's go actually up the stairs, start over there. The Fiat is just around here where we're sitting at the moment. We're sitting at uh, Citroën. Yes. Talk about uh, their cars a little bit later. Um, but let's talk about Volkswagen Group to begin with. And we just want to see the buggy. And I have to say, the buggy is cool, but we had no idea why it was there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, the interior, okay, let's, let's do this. I mean, exterior is I, fun. Interior, know, what is this? I mean, there's nothing in the interior at all. Nothing. It's buggy, a steering wheel, that's it. Buggy is like a, I think it's a, it's a fun, playful kind of, fantasy vehicle I mean to me it reminds me of the Myers Manx it's all kind of reliving the glory days of Volkswagen um, you know Volkswagen success in the American market in my opinion um, the buggy where the hell is that going to be used you know who's going to use it what's what's its intent who's a buyer who's the, what's the demographic um, you know it seems like a fun little play thing so maybe it's just kind of showing the breadth and the bandwidth for electric vehicles yeah. I don't know I mean you know I, it's not it's not a highlight for me you know i mean you know it's cool it's not a highlight of the show for me yeah talking about going a little bit further Skoda, pretty cool show car again they are doing some cool stuff there like, yeah. you've been saying this you know for months and months and months and months and they're continuing doing cool stuff especially on interiors i mean they are definitely moving towards a really really cool direction and we spoke with Pedola from the interior department at uh, at uh, Skoda and we're, we're looking forward to kind of the next steps as well. Yeah, I mean, so far it's been, you know, a couple of very cool vision concepts. This one follows on from last year's vision concept. The interior isn't that far removed from last year's uh, vision concept. But I think it's uh, what I like about Skoda in particular is that it's very aligned with the brand's values. So it's very practical. It's very like, you know, and it's premium enough without kind of stepping on you know let's not for, forget it's in the vw group portfolio so you know it needs to be an affordable product something that is more for the masses than you know stepping on audi's toes so um but at the same time the, the execution of the cars in concept form and also in the production cars that we're seeing on the show stands are really quite high and this is all you know under joseph's caban direction they really changed and I love the fact that they're referencing heritage within that and, and the location, I think, you know, geographically, um, what is, you know, uh, design. And, and Volvo's similarly doing that with uh, Polestar, yeah. rather, um, you know, it's uh, Scandinavian. What is Scandinavian? And so um, Skoda, I think, is doing that for Eastern Europe. You know, what is, um, you know, and uh, it's, it's very, very cool to see that. Um, you know, story being told through that brand. Very much agree. I think, I mean, um, we saw the Seat side as well. We saw the new Cupra. We saw this little one-seater. Obviously, we were very familiar with them uh, before the show already, but we also saw the first electric Seat. And you can clearly see, like, you know, they are playing a lot with their heritage. They're not afraid of changing things. But at the same time, they're trying to push what is fundamentally in that kind of sense, let's say Eastern Europe, and not just Czech, but Eastern Europe, what is Spanish in that sense. And I think this is what sets them apart from a Volkswagen Group perspective, from the um, you know, Volkswagen and, and, and Audi side, because 
you know, obviously we just talked about the buggy, but if we look into like Audi and we say the Q4 concept, it's nothing really that blows, you know, blows your mind off in that sense. It's like, it's what do you expect from them? It's nothing special. But this is exactly the problem because then you have these smaller brands in the group showing you that you can do things a little bit differently, doing a little bit more progressively. And you kind of lose the appeal of a Volkswagen and of, a, of an Audi. You know, and I find that very, very sad. And uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully those guys will will be able to manage a little bit differently in the future. Because otherwise, you know, the kind of reputation that uh, a Seat and the Skoda is building up at the moment is uh, is very, very good. And uh, you know, they have to keep, and the other guys in the Volkswagen Group have to keep up. Well, I think it's I think it's important for you know from for a long time it seemed like there was far too much crossover. It's important for those groups to those brands to have their own identity which you know there was obviously you know modern day car building car manufacturing there's a lot of crossover um, sharing of components and things you know, which is fine as long as people don't see them um, you know when things are you know coming to the foreground a bit much and there's a crossover between a German product and what is essentially trying to be a, a Spanish product um, then that's problematic. So I think the French have done it very, very well because, um, you know, the French market is, is very, very patriotic um, and it's important to have that kind of Frenchness about, which is why they're, you know, very successful in their home market. So in, in Spain also, you know, there's a certain sense of pride um, when people go out and buy a SAT, you know, it's a Spanish vehicle, you yep. know, regardless of what's under, yep. the, under the skin. So I think for manufacturers to kind of play on that um, from an identity perspective, um, you know, is it, very important. But, um, you know, I mentioned the French briefly. For me, you know, um, it's, they, they're really doing some very, very good things. And, uh, you know, there's a reason why we're sitting out here on the, uh, on the Citroën stand. Yeah, and I think in particular, if we compare the French to the Germans, for example, at the moment, I mean, just look at like you know the PSA group in general. Maybe with a little bit of an exception of DS at the moment, but Peugeot, you have right over there. You have the five, uh, the five oh eight. Um, they presented the uh, the new two oh eight, which we had the chance to look in a little bit more detail, which is absolutely incredible. Mm. Um, you know, uh, Citroen showed the Ami One, which is a new mobility concept car which is really well made um, which was the last car from Alex Malval before he went over to Mercedes we've been told yesterday so it's there is this identity that they have here you know they embrace this kind of Frenchness and what is French but they embrace it also in a very classic way that it's you know it, it's not just like you know it's not just for the French it's also for the people that appreciate the French culture and uh, especially in my opinion Peugeot are doing an incredible job with that um, the guys over, of course, at uh, Renault with the Clio, mm, I'm not so sure, you know, especially compared to the 208. Uh, but in general, the, the, the production quality that they're getting out of there is, uh, is really good. And uh, that's, that's going to be interesting to see if they can keep that momentum going, especially from a design language. I mean, um, I think if you want to have that kind of size of a 508 at the moment, that is the car to buy in terms of pure design language from an interior and from an exterior. For me, the same about the 208. There's very, very little that can compete with those two cars in terms of a, a sheer aesthetic point of view, I would say. And we've, we've heard that about, you know, from, from a number of people. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of disagree with you on the Clio 208 thing. Like, there are certain things that I like about the Clio. There are certain things that I like about the Peugeot. They're both competitors they're yeah. direct competitors so it's going to be very interesting to see which um, you know vehicle the French or the indeed whoever it is that's in the market to buy these cars chooses to go with um, I think from an interior perspective the Renault is more progressive I think it's you know the second phase of this um, you know elevated like very very unique um, cockpit design and um, so I I really quite like it um, it's there's a lot of content in that car. It yeah. seems really quite uh, expensive. The execution is very very good. Um, it's it's um, yeah. I mean, when you look at both of these cars, so the Clio and the three oh uh, two oh eight rather. It's to me like what 
you know, how are these guys even making, what's their profit margin on these cars? Yeah. Because the quality is so high. It's like, how are they going to make money? Anyway, the thing is, when you get out of that and you realize, actually, you know, now it's economies of scale. They're actually manufacturing cars in Eastern Europe, places where it's actually a bit cheaper. There is some component sharing within certain vehicles within the, you know, the, the Peugeot uh, portfolio. So, you know, it's cheaper to make certain things but I mean you know tactile quality for example and that switch gear within that 208 is actually very very impressive um, you know you've got this huge panoramic roof it's all like perceived quality within that cockpit is something you know this tiny steering wheel like the seats even like you yeah know, the material within the seats the detail the attention to detail on this interior and not to mention the screen you know it's all like and they're doing they're making a lot of noise from a technology perspective as well. So Clio, they have this very large uh, portrait style screen within. I was trying to sit in there and play around, but I wasn't able to. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, they, let's just say one thing, it's swamped here. Like there are so many people that we haven't really seen this. I mean, there's still eight manufacturers missing out at this show. So, you know, Big names too, like Hyundai made a big splash here last year, not here this year. Volvo's Ford, not here? Not here. Volvo, like this is the only show that they've historically in the last two or three years have attended religiously. You know, they've sat out Detroit for the last few years, but they've always here. Now they're not here, but Polestar is here, so eh. Jaguar Land Rover is not here. JLR, not here. No, not here. Car of the Year winner, not here. No one to accept the award. Uh, it's, uh, anyway, Opel, Opel's not here? Opel not here, but they, they weren't here last year as well. It's kind of like, a, it's, a tr it's a tricky situation now that they're owned by PSA as well. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of like expenditure, people having, the companies have, have to spend a considerable amount of money here. If you don't have any new product, don't bother. Um, so I think that's kind of the general uh, consensus. And I'm, I'm missing out on a few more. Infinity, obviously not here. Um, so there's a lot of people sitting out but still I mean this is a small show it's it's still like very very well attended and, and there's a lot of cool stuff and you know even if we're not talking about um, your your third party kind of uh, customizers <laughs> which there are plenty of um, and showing some very vulgar and you know very vehicles <laughs> created with some let, very let, very questionable let's things. say that whatever you want to do to your car Geneva is the place to oh, be, yeah, positive and negative. Someone <laughs> you know? will turn your Rolls Royce Phantom or Wraith into an atrocity if you pay them some money. Uh, so anyway. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's why we don't talk about these things, of course. <laughs> um, but let's talk about something. We have received the news yesterday. There was a world record for a production car in terms of pricing. So we're not talking about auctioning off a car and stuff like that. We're talking about the actual price of a production car, which is the uh, the Bugatti, the new one, which will sell, or like which sells, what's a one-off, for 17 million euros. Yeah. 17 million euros for a car. But, I mean, surely that, that, that can't be considered a production car then. If it's a one-off, you know, it's just like that Rolls Royce that they commissioned, whoever the hell commissioned. That was in excess of that, if well, I'm not mistaken. Well, so, so that this personalized is commissioned Rolls Royce, whatever its name was, shown at Villa. Uh, Sweet Tail. Well, Sweet Tail. Sweet Tail. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, can you really consider it a production car if it's a one-off? Eh, I don't think so. And and it, honestly, it's not. You know, the Bugatti. It's like you know, the name itself conjures up these images and these, you know. But la voiture. Noir. Noir. <laughs> it is all, impressive. What the hell kind of name is that? <laughs> for one. It, it is very impressive. The black though. car, for yeah. those of you that want a direct translation. Um, I mean, imp impressive how? Like, I mean, I just, I don't get it. From a design perspective, probably the only and the most impressive bits to me are the wheels. Like, that's it. I don't really, you know, I don't see it. Like, I mean, it's, I don't. The rear end, maybe the tail lamps, you know, some intricacies in the details, but shit, if you're paying 18 million for a car, you better wish that some of these things be made of crystal or gold or something, yeah, you know? I don't know. I'm just, I'm not, maybe I just don't get it, you know? Maybe if I had 18 million, 
you would probably not to buy spend, a Bugatti. You know, I might want to like consider I commissioning do, something. Like, I don't know. I just, I just don't get it. I do have to say, what I, I, I was very skeptical in the beginning. I'm not the biggest fan of the front because it's a little bit more like it's a bit too much Gran Turismo for me. But the rear, I really have to say, the lighting of the rear, the kind of you know, the surfacing on the rear, the kind of well, how it's you know how it's sculpted. I do really like that, and I think it's a big step forward from the Devo. I think the Devo was a big letdown from what the Chiron used to be, and if I now look into this into this black car. It's just like, I can see much, much more where potentially an evolution is going to come from. And the rumor is this is based on a Chiron. Yeah, so um, obviously then the power is definitely there and all these things. The engine is definitely there. But um, it, it was just impressive just for the, the sheer amount of money that, is, that it sold. Um, but it's obviously really interesting because um, the former chief executive of Volkswagen, his son, started a company which is called PS. I'm going to keep on saying that because Eric has his problems. It's obviously yeah, very I'll German. Just, I'll just call it a peach. <laughs> um, so, but anyway, the, the, to finish on the Bugatti thing, oh yeah. so it was basically commissioned by Ferdinand Peach. Um, and then his, so it's his son then yep. that started his own company called uh, Peach. And PH for all you normal you. people. Yeah, for the Germans <laughs> out there. Sorry, I'm, I'm butchering your language. But anyway, um, I, you know, I want to know about your, your opinion on that car because um, I've got my own, but I'd like to hear yours because it seems like you spent more time over there and certainly enjoying the, uh, the accommodations upstairs because they've got a full on bar where they serve you cocktails straight from Munich. Like it's a bar that's basically just been transplanted from Munich to here, serving everything that you can imagine. Um, so it's yeah. uh, it was very well frequented by Marta. <laughs> it's uh, it was pretty much a hotspot for everybody. And thank you for putting me here as like you know someone who <laughs> likes to drink a lot. Like uh, that's not what I do. Don't worry. Um, no, like, I I have to say before we went to PH together, we went to Aston Martin. So I think we have to kind of explain a little bit how all of these things come together. And as you, most of you know, who listen to the podcast regularly, you watch the videos, I am absolutely in love with Aston Martins. But I, you know, my love is a little bit falling apart since that Vantage came out. And so we saw the Lagonda. The Lagonda was, for me, from an exterior perspective, absolutely horrendous. The interior was quite old school, but I, I do like that. The other ones were just supercars, sports cars, anything that had to do with the Q. So for me, this is actually going away from what I believe an Aston Martin should look like or should be and what it should represent. Now, when I go to PS, it is, of course, a little bit of a love child and it has a very big influence from an Aston Martin, from a Jaguar, from the shoulders you can see, like, you know, maybe from a 964 Porsche and stuff like that. But it is very classic. It is extremely well resolved. Um, there's almost no mistake, and you could say you could say that there's a bad thing as well. It's like there's nothing that really stands out on this car in particular. But the simplicity of it, and for me, that what makes the beauty of it. You know, the, the the treatment of the surfaces, the sculpting. Not everything is perfect. The rear can be a little bit better, but um, this is for me something where I went up to uh, to Ria Stark, who's the, uh, the the creative, uh, the chief creative officer, and also the co-founder, and uh, to his colleague Nico, and I said, like, look, guys, this is what I want to see at Aston Martin, and we've also had other people like, oh, you know, it's boring, or like, you know, it's something, it's nothing really new, but for me, I like that a lot, and I like that they go into that direction because of this kind of, you know, it's a Swiss company. Um, which I think is uh, hasn't been around here for a long time. And that's 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 the one thing. But there's always something that you can connect with Switzerland, which is elegance, you know, which is this timeless classic that you have in watches, for example, as well. And I think this is what PH, from a purely aesthetic perspective, also from an in, you know interior, from what we have seen, have achieved with that. Yeah, is this kind of idea of what is Switzerland? What do we, uh, from a from a creative perspective, you know, think of when we're thinking of uh, of the Swiss? And that's why I personally like it. You know, that's why I think for me this is the right direction um, to to go. But I also know that you think sometimes a little bit differently about these things. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I I haven't spent as much time looking at that car as you have. To me, it seems like an also brand. It's like, you know, it's something that we've seen. We, it's been there. It's been, you know, it's done that. It's been executed by other brands quite well, quite successfully. Um, you know, it's it's fine to like, you know, want to emulate something that's been successful, that's well resolved. And I see far too much classical Aston Martin in that and not enough progression, certainly from a platform perspective, you know. And, you know, let's not forget, they're not real. These cars, you can't actually drive them. They don't, they're not real cars yet. Um, but, you know, that can be said also for, you know, the 003 on the Aston Martin stand. You know, there's a, a car in there with a half interior. I mean, it's... All of that was done in an alarmingly fast pace. So I was talking to um, Tobias Schulman yesterday, who is head of exterior design at Aston and uh, Loganda. All of those cars were non-existent when he joined, and he joined less than a year ago. Yeah. So, I mean, when you think about that and the pace, the sheer, like, speed that they're working, I mean, and so yesterday was his birthday, and he came off and he showed, like, four new cars on his birthday. So that must have just been a hell of an experience for him. Uh, I can't even imagine what that would have felt like. But I think if you look at the Lagonda, for example, and I'm with you, it's not to everyone's taste. I think, proportionally, it's very different. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, it's, uh, from a surfacing perspective, it's actually quite nice, but proportionally, that is not going to be to everyone's taste. But I think, fundamentally, that's the target demographic. That's the people that they are looking to go after, you know? Maybe the CEO in, um, you know, Shanghai or whatever doesn't actually want to get chauffeured to um, you know to work in his in his phantom or whatever and yeah you know, maybe he wants something that is a bit more future uh, gazing you know something that is like that Lagonda you know in terms of space in terms of I mean it makes a very very different statement and um, I don't think it's bad but you know it's definitely to taste I don't think it's a poorly done um, you know vehicle I, again like you know, if we start talking about the more kind of traditionally sports car oriented, what Aston Martin conceivably stands for, um, yes, I think that there is, you know, for these for these like super sports cars, um, they're following other supercar manufacturers. It's not a DB9 anymore. It's not Elegance. It's not your James Bond. Yeah. It's, it's it's very different um, kind of tack that they're taking. But if you look at, for example, the interior design on that car, um, the 003, that I really, really quite liked because, first of all, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm, I was extremely impressed at how minimalistic it is. And it's all about, you know, suiting the, the car, you know. Um, so it's showcasing a very progressive, you know, future-oriented um, treatment whereby all they're showing really is somebody's iPhone. Right? Yeah. which they bring into the car. And let's think, everybody wants that. Everybody's right. talking about that. It's just that Aston Martin is actually showcasing. The screen is about this thick, this big, displaying only the information that you need. The steering wheel is like probably the most, and, and the little element behind it, uh, is the most kind of traditional in the sense that it is using leather. It is using traditional materials, yeah. you know? Um, those are things that are, and, and, but then there are no actual seats. You yeah. know, there's like a very thin, it's all about minimalizing like lightweight to the maximum. Like, um, and I think it works quite well. And there's some really cool kind of almost crocodile like um, treatment to this like scales, you mm. know, the interior. So I think it's rewriting what an Aston Martin could be. Certainly in the future, certainly in terms of. Um, you know, it's clientele, it's personalization, elements, you know, Q, you mentioned. Yeah. Um, and, and it's great that you actually brought up watches because I think the interior of that 003 and that element in particular is very much akin to, it's not an interior design anymore. Yeah. This is like specialized bespoke watches, like timepieces to intricate detailing. It's like, that is to me quite a triumph, yeah. I think. No, but I think this is the point and this is where you know, we look at things differently. I'm, I'm seeing Aston Martin always as the James Bond car. And this is what, you know, kind of breaks my heart from a creative perspective because it's not a James Bond car anymore. I don't think we're going to see 
an Aston Martin in, you know, 10 years in, in, in a James Bond movie, unless the movies change completely or something like that. Um, but that's okay. You know, it's just for me personally that I have to understand like Aston goes into a different direction and maybe then something like PA is more towards my direction, you know, and I, I can um, I can understand that. But let's talk about something where I'm... Where, where, where I, so we, like, we have to give you a little bit of an idea. So I have in my office, I have a scale model of the Honda Urban EV. I love this thing. When we came in, to the, to the show yesterday, the first thing I did is I went to Honda because they said, oh, we're going to show you the E prototype, which is pretty much 98% the Honda E. And I love it. This thing is incredible. It's fully electric. And it's quite close, actually, to the concept car that we have seen in, uh, in Frankfurt in 2017. And I'm in absolute awe of this thing. I mean, what those guys have done... Um, obviously, the, especially the interior has changed a little bit. It's not just one big screen. It's like, you know, four smaller screens now, but they kept the cameras outside. Um, we're, I'm very, very hoping for the aftermarket rims to come in because that would be absolutely perfect. But speaking of, you know, getting a concept car into a production car, I think the last one I can remember that was anywhere close to that was probably the Volkswagen Artyan. that was almost unchanged. And the, and, the, and the Honda E gets extremely close to that as well. And it's, it's absolutely lovely. And I want to have one. I really, I really do. I went up to Dave Merrick, uh, head of Honda uh, US for, uh, for design. And I was like, okay, so where, where, where can we sign up for this thing? <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so incredible for me uh, that they've shown that here. And I did not expect it to be that great. I saw videos before, but... Uh, I know you, you criticized it a little bit, you said that it's not 100% true and not what you were hoping for, but it is very close. Well, look, I'm not mad at it. I like, I like it. I'm not, am I enthu as enthusiastic about its design as I was about the Urban EV? No. Um, you know, I thought the Urban EV was like this cool, chunky car with some amazing detailing. Um, the interior, you know, yeah, I, I like the production, or this is as close, like you said, to the production interior as we're going to see right now. Um, but I heard that these cars were actually developed side by side, so it wasn't like, I don't know why they chose to show the urban EV kind of prototype, or concept rather, before, and then change it so massively, or rather, develop another one side by, alongside it that had such you know changes now of course things are going to change when you're going into production where you can't show certain headlamps or you know whatever from a cost cutting perspective but i don't think it's it's down to cost i think except maybe you know the the screen on the interior for example you know but i think it was just a chunky like really sweet proposition very product design oriented with some superb detailing and this production version, while nice, doesn't have that same feel to me. Doesn't have that same, you know, square kind of tough little, um, you know, guy appeal. Yeah. And, you know, I still like it. You know, I like the front end way better than the rear, I think. Um, I like it a whole lot better than the urban coupe thing. Yeah. yeah. Which oh, yeah. I felt was like, you know, super long overhang, like not very pleasant proportioned in my opinion just like, yeah it didn't look very nice um, but the urban EV I did prefer to to this um, you know production thing but again it's not a bad if they can get it into what this looks like into production um, they're gonna have a nice winner on its hands I think but again it, it, it's not the urban EV and, and that's sad yeah but like we would never you know, I think we were all clear that it was never going to happen exactly like that. I mean, there were some bits and pieces where you say, like, especially the, 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 the lights, I think, um, the, the little screen in the, in the front, that's going to be difficult. But um, I'm happy with it. I like it. And I also um, like the little, the, you know, the little line that came up and terminated into a little plug. I mean, little cool little details like that that were, you know, obviously it's not going to make it into production, but I think they could have kept the square tail lamps they could have kept the kind of you know cut off um, headlamps in the front um, you know done something a bit different mm. perhaps with the uh, the front end graphic um, made it you know maybe not with screens and all the rest but 
you know, just have it more, give him a stronger identity, yep. I think, you know. It's a little weak, I think, looking compared to the Urban Evil. So, you mentioned Polestar earlier, and obviously Volvo not being here. Technically, this is a Volvo. <laughs> yeah. It is, uh, it is uh, one of the concepts that they've shown a few years ago, actually here in Geneva as well. And I have to say, when I saw the picture, so they released this whole thing a few days actually before Geneva in Gothenburg, in their new headquarter. When I saw the pictures, I was just like, oh, this looks a little bit out of proportion. It looks a little bit too high. Like, I wasn't 100% sure, or especially after the Polestar one, because that one was so cool. Then we actually went into the box, and it really is a box. Yeah, you go in, it's closed off. You have two little entrances. So it's this kind of full-on experience. You're almost blocked out of the entire show. Um, and it's really, 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 really good. I mean, I was extremely pleasantly surprised that it's not that high as it looks like on the, on the pictures. The stands is really good. The exterior in general is incredible. I think, you know, the kind of proportion, the surfacing, it's again very, very close to what the Volvo concept was like. The only letdown that I personally had was the interior. I think they could have done a much better job on the interior. It was a little bit, you know, let's say it was too simple. I think they could have, they could have done a little bit more with that. I wasn't 100% sure about that. But in general, still a big winner um, compared to, you know, com compared to other people's and, uh, and expectations. It's a little bit a shame that they didn't have the Polestar 1 here to compare it with as well. They only had two Polestar 2s. But great, great thing, great little thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. you know, I think, so Max Bassoni, head of Polestar and also head of exterior design at Volvo, it seems like anything that he kind of touches and gets involved in is, um, ends up to be quite, quite good. Um, I, you know, the 40, so the 40.2 and the 40.1, um, basically, those were unveiled, like you said, years ago, but none of them actually came to Geneva. 40.2 never made it here. And that's what we're seeing here is 40.2 um, in production form. And the thing about the 40.2 it was a bit more of a crossover SUV thing. This is more of a kind of butch, all road, um, you know, fastback. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know. I mean, I, I quite like that aesthetic because it's it's simple, it's elegant, it's pure. It's got a lot of Volvo bits, which you know, in the in the tail amps, for mm -hmm. example, like Thor's hammer, like you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's it's still very Volvo from that respect. But the interior, as you mentioned, is very um, is, is is all new. It's the first kind of all new Polestar interior because yep. the last Polestar heavily refer referenced the S90. So. Um, but from an exterior perspective, a typology perspective, I think it's quite robust with these, you know, um, cl the cladding. It's, you know, something that I think customers now are looking for. Um, you know, something that is still elegant, pure, refined, subtle, but that seems like it's, you know, quite tough and has some capability. So from an exterior perspective, I think it's quite nice. And the interior, I don't think they needed to do much more. They still, they do have some kind of unique elements that mm -hmm. are specific to Polestar, which are nice. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's it's clean, it's it's fine, um, you know. It's uh, it's it's well done, it's well resolved, and I think um, it's it's a good car, especially at the price point, the entry price that they're aiming at for this. You know, it's quite low for an electric car. So um, it's yeah, going to be the first mass production Polestar. Yes. Yeah? yes. So the. Uh, the Polestar one was, I think, limited to a few hundred. This one is going to be first mass production, so that's the big difference. And first think, all well. electric. First all electric because as well. the Polestar one is not all electric. It's a hybrid, isn't it? Yes. So, moving on, right over there, so like right behind us pretty much, we have BMW. And I know we took a break from BMW bashing and we have bashed BMW for a long time. But I have to keep on going with this now because they show nothing new. Nothing really that I would have hoped would show a little bit of a progression, something new that's coming out. I don't know, like I've, I've been going to shows for a number of years now. 
And for, you know, I don't know how long I can remember, I have seen an i8 on a BMW show stand. Guys, what are you doing? Where is it Where is it going? You know, like, new 3 Series, and X3, whatever. Yeah, you can say those are world premieres, but those are technically facelift. I understand that, you know, they all argue like, oh, you know, it's new technology. Yes, but where is the new stuff coming out of BMW? Where are the new kind of ideas coming out of BMW? We don't see them, yeah? We don't, we don't see any of them here, anything new. Um, Mercedes is very, very similar. They've shown like the EQC, which is, I don't know, EQ, E, whatever, I don't know. It's pretty much a C-class electric. Where is this like, where are you guys, the, you know, going to? What, 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 is, what is the goal? Like, I understand like the electric, uh, you know, electrification and stuff like that. But purely from a design perspective, those two were quite a big disappointment, especially compared to um, you know, even if you see Volkswagen and stuff like that showing up with concept cars, ideas where, where the future could go to. And that was actually really a disappointment for me. I mean, I was at BMW for just um, 10 minutes and I was just like, I've, I've seen all of this before. And uh, it seems like they want to sell the cars here, but not want to show where they're going to go in the future. And for me and talking, you know, us as a, from, a, from a design perspective, um, absolute disappointment. Well, um, to be honest, I, I've been here what, like uh, a day and a half, <laughs> and um, there's a few things I haven't seen, but I didn't I didn't spend all that much time on uh, Mercedes stand, and I didn't even I didn't even go to BMW, which which is right over there. So I haven't even been on that stand, so I couldn't really tell you. Um, you know, there there is the new uh, what is it? E I don't even know what it, what the nomenclature is for that. Anyway, the new three series Wag Touring. Um, which I would like to go and check out, but only because I'm a 3 Series owner and it would be nice to see what they're doing now. But um, I wasn't impressed by the last 3 Series in sedan form, so I, I don't know, but you know, Touring's hold a special place in my heart, so we'll see. Um, I don't really know what's happening in BMW. Um, you know, it's not, <laughs> many people ask me this, um, I, I'm not within that company, so I couldn't tell you. Um, so and and uh, you know I don't think it's right to kind of speculate about what might be happening, but there are other companies that are showing more progressive things, and I think we're on a stand right now where, you know, PSA is actually more kind of design-led, it would seem now than um, ever under Gilles Vidal. Um, you know, their company, uh, Peugeot, for example, has done very very good things. Um, now, you know, we're starting to see some bits coming out from, uh, from Pierre Leclerc and um, yeah, I really, I really think that, you know, this is what more companies should be kind of doing, you know, you speak to designers, everybody loves working at, uh, at PSA yeah. because they're super cool companies and in terms of a creative perspective, you know, and when you're a designer, you know, you really just want that stimulus you know and um, so there's there's lots of very happy designers at these two companies um, so yeah it's, uh, I think it's very very cool to see this um, French perspective the Germans yeah I mean it's they're not showing me that much stuff to get excited about yeah yeah so to kind of finish this off a little bit um, and before we get to the end of our tops and flops and everything, let's talk about the supercars a little bit. Talk about McLaren. McLaren not really showing anything new here, but it was the first time we actually got to see the speed tail, which I was a little bit, let's say I had my problems with it, and I still have my problems with it because I think that kind of front bit is terrible. But. Um, it's okay, you know, I'm much more comfortable with it now having seen it properly and stuff like that, so that's the one bit. But what do we think of Ferrari, man? Like, you know, Ferrari showing another, what is it, the FA Tributo, I think it's called. Um, another, you know, small, um, uh, small, small series production car, I think it is. So they are definitely continuing their trend of using a very well-established platform that they have and building on that platform and, and you know, making it exclusive series. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
the McLaren first, uh, you know, I'll just talk, touch on that a bit. It's always important to see these things in the, in the metal, in person. You know, pictures don't do it justice. You need to come in and see volumes, proportions, you know, and walk around the car and really get a taste for it. So I'm not, you know, I'm not mad at it. Um, Ferrari, it, you know, if I'm, if, if I'm perfectly honest, I, you know, there's certain elements of that car that I like. I like the kind of wraparound on the rear, but I don't, I don't think it's in any way, you know, an improvement over the 458. Like the 458 was, in my opinion, like the one to have. And if I could find the used one and if I could afford one that wasn't beat to bits, I would go for that car because mm. I think the 488 lost a lot from the 458, and now the F8 Tributo. I mean, I just, you know, I don't. It's a facelift of a facelift. <laughs> and I'm not a big fan of it, I personally. I don't really see the point. Um, you know, maybe it's a send-off for all of Ferrari's V8-powered cars, you know, tri a tribute to the last of Ferrari 8s. I don't know, maybe there's something within the name. Um, I'm not a big fan. I mean, you know, supercars are just permeate this show it's like um, you know if you want to see supercars come to geneva this yeah. is where supercars are it always has been this is supercar haven again maybe because a lot of people have money you know they stop by here hey you know on their skiing holidays let's just pass by the you know set on and check it out <laughs> and buy a supercar on my way to Verbier or whatever i mean i don't know um but it's uh definitely cool to see that you know, there's still passion within the industry. People are still putting out supercars. And, uh, and you know, the thing is, you know, how many supercar manufacturers do you need and how many supercars do you need? But again, it, I think it works into that personalization aspect. You know, you don't need a bunch of 30 grand or 40 or 50 grand watches, but some collectors do. They go out there yeah. and they can't wear them all at the same time, but, you know, they like having them. And, you know, supercars, I think, is very much the same thing so I'm going to draw that you know uh, watch analogy as well um, so yeah I mean the, there were there were a few things that were more appealing to me than the supercars though and that is you know Nissan's concept for the next yes. Qashqai yeah. very appealing um, Qashqai or Qashqai uh, Nissan and Infiniti do uh, concepts very well this one out of uh, NDE which uh, you know we, we know Matt Weaver we know quite a lot of people out of that studio um, they've done a very very good job on that concept um, just, just to add something to that I think if you this is one of those kind of concept that really grows on you I think we've been wandering around through the show a few times and every time we stop by the Nissan stand there was something new that we discovered um, the interiors like you know from a conceptual point of view have been great at Nissan over the past few years I like that kind of element of um, the middle console going all the way through, the seats being separate. Um, they have almost like, you know, perfected that nowadays. That's really, really cool. Um, but really, like speaking with Matt a little bit as well and looking into the car, uh, you know, in detail, that was, was, was really made the difference for me uh, in terms of a concept car. And that's something I think on, just on paper, if you would see the pictures, it's like, oh, you know, it's another Nissan, like I am concept car, whatever. But you actually stand in front of it there's much more to it and that's what I really appreciated because when we first saw it I was like I'm not so sure when I see it now after like a day or so it's like hmm that's really nice yeah I mean from a design perspective you know they they take certain liberties which is really really nice to see um, you know I there's a lot of details on that car that I particularly like some things that are challenging that you know have been actually well resolved like the shoulder and the twist and you know coming into a, a horizontal surface on the haunch on the rear that would have been really tough to pull off i imagine um, and they did a very good job um, also the lamellas you know how they go around the car and that single piece that's repeated repeated throughout the design so i mean the interior is just kind of icing on the cake i think because it's such a nice tranquil space but Again, the, the clue of this car and what it is that it kind of represents for the future is, you know, the, the, the last letter in the name of that concept. And, yeah. um, you know, so it's looking at it, you know, in terms of, in terms of um, you know, uh, dimensions and all of that, you can kind of see where the next generation Qashqai, which also was conceived and built in, in London, London, you know, 
basically took over as the um, the number one selling family car, you know, superseded the Golf, um, was designed at NDE as well. And this is coming in under the, you know, with uh, Matt Weaver had a hand in that. He also had in the Juke, um, you know, two kind of runaway um, success stories for, for Nissan. And it's really good to see that they're, you know, moving, moving it on. Yeah, yep. so it's, uh, that was one of my, um, Certainly, one of the highlights of the show here for me, um, for a, from a debut perspective. So before we get to our tops and flops of the show, is there anything? I, I couldn't think that we forgot anything in, that, that was so important to talk about. Ah, one thing, because there was so much hype about it. Automobile Pinin Farina. Yeah. Supercar, built on the Remark platform. We've been told, or we we saw actually on the platform because it's exactly the same one. Mm. Um, what do you think? I, I, I told you I found it was a little bit of a love child of a Ferrari and a McLaren, but it does look very nice. So from an aesthetic point of view, there is not much, but I argue, similar to what you did earlier with the, with the PAs, so I kind of seen that before. Yeah, we've seen it out of Ferrari. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, let's not forget Pininfarina's heritage and history here, you know. This is a company that was designing Ferraris for a very, very long time, um, you know. And now, the, so it's the first car, as you said, under Automobili Pininfarina or Pininfarina Automobili. Which one is it? I don't forget. Automobili Pininfarina. So they're so based out of Munich. So they have all of these new kind of underpinnings. But to me, that car is very Ferrari, screams Ferrari. Um, and um, it's not a bad thing because it's a very well done, nicely conceived Ferrari. It's a pretty um, car. It is a pretty car, but there's a lot of bits about that front end in particular that remind me of the Sergio, for example. Yep. Um, you know, it's, I don't know, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not bad, but again, it's not like maybe that forward thinking from what you'd expect of what was, you know, one of the leaders in the whole carrosseria you know industry mm. um you know and and so it's all designed similarly you know showing that um what looks like a four-door lamborghini with actually butterfly doors <laughs> very nice you know i wouldn't mind riding around in that it looks cool but it also looks like something that lambo could have done a couple of years ago so i don't know i mean i don't know if there's a, if i think there's there's more to use uh, an analogy that Chris Bengel told me years ago, you know, there's more music that can be written with these 89 keys. Yeah. Like there's, you know, you don't need, you know, there's, there's a lot more that can be said and done. And it's like, I think, I don't know why we're kind of failing to see that, um, you know, um, maybe it's people kind of being a bit reserved or too soft, you know, I mean, you know, we talked about this during the last podcast. I went to the RCA, so maybe it's like when I go and I see visionary proposals like VTOLs and mm -hmm. things based on a, a Land Rover branding. It's like, and then I come here and I'm like, eh, I don't know, maybe I'm getting old. Maybe I'm just <laughs> been seeing too many of these things, too many shows, or you know, it's I'm, I'm maybe I'm jaded by the whole thing. But I'm, I'm also like getting kind of bored <laughs> it's like I'm no i agree kind of bored. I, I i agree and it, you know it's it's also something i'm not quite sure if only the germans say it but you know there's this very common saying in germany is like it's better to copy something well than to start something from scratch in a bad way or to show something that is new or inno innovative in a bad way and i think this is what sums everything up quite a bit you know, because like this is exactly what an automobile opinion Farina is all about. This is exactly what um, you know those Ital design things are all about. Is they're not fundamentally new. They take their inspiration, of course, from other things, but it's exactly that thing. It's like it's it's well made. It looks good and everything, but you know, if you if you would aim for something completely different, then probably your risk of of failing is much higher. And who? Who shall we blame for that? That's uh, you know that, that's obviously the market that demands that, that the innovation is not being pushed into that kind of direction. Um, but we've seen that here in Geneva, I think again, quite a lot. Is that the what? It's still a market-driven industry, and for somebody to break out, 
that's mm. different, you know. And I think some people try, but they are not really consequent in terms of how they do it. Um, and you know, I'm I'm interested to see, and I, and I expect actually Frankfurt to be more conservative I, I will, than what we see here. Um, it could be that some people wake up, but in general, like as a small resume, I think for the show is like we've seen some really nice execution of the of, of the cars. We've seen some really great designs in general, but have we seen innovative design? I would probably say not much. Yeah. And that's where it's going to be interesting, especially, you know, with all these things such as CES happening as well, where they are competing. Uh, as a little bit of a, a summary of the show, but let's get to the fun part. Three categories, my friend. Best car of the show. Oh yeah, best production car of the show. Best concept car of the show. Worst car of the show. Which one do you want to start with? Um, I'll go concept. I'll go concept car because concept cars. This is one that we haven't talked about because you saved the best for last. I think the, the little Citroen ME one, you, you actually did mention it briefly, but I think that is that just takes a cake for me, um, yes. you know, because I think it's it's very progressive. It's very cool for uh, voitures sans permis, so basically cars that you can drive around without a license in France, purely electric. Um, what I love a lot about this story, actually, because the, the ME story... Um, is is going to become a new product line within the Citroen product portfolio. So at the moment, um, they have DS, they have Citroen, so C1, etc. Um, they're going to have a purely electric um, Z car, um, but then ME is going to sit at the lower kind of end of the of the spectrum of the range, and this is the first one that we're seeing. And if and this whole this uh, shows a lot of promise, um, I think, in terms of, and I, you know, I said it before, I'll say it again. The French companies are really the ones that are standing out in terms of design, showcasing some really cool stuff. But that car is full of really, really cool ideas, um, and yeah, it is. You know, there are certain things that have been seen in the Osmos, and there's you know things that reference history, and mm -hmm. but I think from a now perspective look around and y there's nothing like that right now nothing that showcases design quite as much and as much as i love the panda um and it's good to see them kind of showcasing that i think the panda is going to be another multiple thing if they show it like that um you know in terms of appealing to designers without actually appealing to the buyers you know yeah. and and i think for me this little uh, this little ME1 Your is, little friend. <laughs> is, is super cool um, because it's not only going to appeal to designers, but it's also people that have, you know, a, uh, a need for, you know, traveling around urban environments, parking, um, you know, thank you for vacuuming, yeah. sir. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's like, um, I, I think for me, it's the concept car of the show for sure. Yes, I agree. I agree. The little friend. I mean, for everybody who doesn't speak uh, French, Ami means friend. Uh, you know, uh, in, translated into English. And what I really like about this is actually is like you don't you don't see this on the first side. So this thing has three doors, and all three doors are exactly the same. And that is just so cool. I like that principle. Mm. It's so cool. It's efficient. You know, they think about it. They think about how to keep it cheap. You know, to reuse. Um, components, even large components such as doors. So, yeah, not much to say. And the color scheme is just cool. Yeah, yeah? it is cool. It, it is, is cool. really, really cool. Like it's, a, I like this little implementation. If you see it on a picture, if you actually hear at the show, check out the bottom of the front is actually a Citroen logo that is 3D printed into the whole thing. It's really, really cool. These little bits and pieces. Um, and you can clearly see where it's going uh, with them. So we have a clear winner over here. No, no, yeah, no dispute no contest, over there. No contest. Production car. Production car. Um, well, for me, it's a toss-up. Um, you know, because I like the French cars again. I'm gonna go French. I'm sorry. You know, it's me maybe showing my patriotism, but uh, it's a toss-up because I. I really like the 208. From an interior perspective, it wins hands down. Mm -hmm. um, but I also like the Renault, and I like how like it's you know voluptuous without kind of string. It's emotional. It's quite good. The interior is quite good as well. Um, 
but you know I do prefer I would say the exterior of the Clio and then the interior of the Peugeot um, if you had, if I had to choose just one um, you know from a from a lighting a whole kind of brand energy like dynamic kind of perspective I'd go 208 um, but I don't like this kind of undulating surface on the body side maybe I need to spend a bit more time looking at it it's less kind of clean far more busy um, but from an interior hands down it wins the lighting I really love like the Peugeot yeah. Looking great. <laughs> um, so yeah, and for such a small car as well, for yeah. it to have so much character, um, really, really good. Yeah. Well done. So, for me, and I'm just going to put this out there as a special mention. If it would be a hundred percent Honda E all the way, you know, like I said, I'm in absolutely love with this thing. But because it's only 98 percent, it's a little bit. Uh, let, let's leave it out of the contest. 208, hands down, but a little butt on this one, the GT line. Because there's, they, they show the GT line over here as well, which is a little bit sportier. And this is what makes it so great for me on the exterior. So much character, has the super sportiness with it as well. You've mentioned enough about the interior, I don't need to go into detail with that, it's just fantastic. So, weird line, man, it's never happened. This has never happened before, what, what is going on here? Maybe we're spending too much time with one another. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, don't, don't, don't put any rumors out here. Start looking like my. Uh, soon you're gonna start looking like me, like like a little dog. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank no, you, I'm Mr. Gilly, man. I'm just kidding. I so, love you too. What are, uh, we, what are we moving into now? What are we moving into? We're, we're gonna do worst the, car the of worst. the show. Worst car of the show. All right, do you wanna kick off or should I? I'll kick off. And this is for me, hands down, not even a choice. Uh, which is the Hispano Suiza, which was actually shown here, which we were quite surprised because before the show there were two Hispano Suizas. One of them is not is not here, which is the one that's run by Erwin Himmel, former Volkswagen designer. Uh, I think he used to run a Citrus studio when it was still open. And this one that is here now is apparently run by the people who are actually related to the pe like the, to the founder of Hispano Suiza. But man, this thing is shit. <laughs> like, you know, I'm not the kind of guy that really goes, like, you know, I'm, I'm happy to voice my opinion, but I can, you know, easily say like, oh, you know, we can do things a little bit different here. But this thing is absolutely horrible. Nothing works properly in this thing. The, the front end, the grill in particular, is something that you just want to throw into the bin. The production quality is absolutely terrible as well. Um, you have gaps where you can put a hand in and then it's super, you know, like everything in this whole thing does not make sense whatsoever. I have no idea why they did that. Um, they wanted to do something with the wheel archers that go back to the old Hispano Suites. It's like, what are you doing? Like, you have absolutely no idea about car design. You have no idea about proportions. You have no idea about anything that has to do with surfacing whatsoever. Um, look, I'm going to be very honest with you. I hope this whole thing goes down. I don't want to see this ever again. It's so horrible. Um, I've, we, I've looked at it yesterday with our colleague Daniel and we were just like, we were ashamed just to look at it, you know, and yeah, sorry, so rent over, Hispano Suiza, worst of the show, probably the worst of the last 10 years of car shows that I could, that I could look back, absolutely horrible. Wow, that's some strong words. Yeah, I mean, I, I pass by the Hispano Suiza, it's like, there are so many odd weird things that are coming out from many different manufacturers like no name people that you've never even heard of coming out with crazy ass stuff and whatever it's not it's not the best and but i think from a personal like from a personal perspective and this is actually quite difficult um on the Jajaro stand, so everyone knows GFG came out with, you know, a new car from his own company, you know, Giorgetto Jajaro and his son Fabrizio, hence the initials, um, came out with a new car which they launched here in Geneva last year, which was done for a client. This year they came out with another one, I don't even know its name, but it's something that you would have seen in 1970, um, you know, a 
high riding, and probably something that he sold to one of these many yep. car manufacturers that was done, and blanking on the name of, but I'm sure we've seen it in the 1970s and 80s, a high riding, you know, four by four, um, you know, car that maybe could be seen in Mad Max, you know, like Lamborghini-like, um, you know, wedge shape, but high riding, so four wheel drive with a couple of skis in the back to complete the package and I think this is a spectacular fall from grace from the man that gave us the original golf the panda um, you know things like that I think you know just you got the money man just quit while you're ahead just pack it in I don't think that it is a good thing for you know it's not a good legacy to see things like that so quite harsh I'm afraid I'm sorry I'm not a fan um, the Jajaro thing and it, apparently it is going to make production I don't know I mean to me it looks like a concept and it's not a very good one at that and so that's why I'm uh, yeah that's my worst car of the show unfortunately right. so let's wrap this up this was the 2019 Geneva Motor Show the uh, Salon de l'Auto 2019 it's been an absolute pleasure. We like the show a lot, we've, we've mentioned this. It's small, if you ever have the chance to come here, and if you have the chance to come on the press days, do it, you know. We know it's expensive to get to the hotels, the flights, depending on where you're coming from, can be very, very expensive, but it's definitely worth a visit. If you are a car designer and you have the chance to come here, you have to do it because it's, uh, it's the place to meet people from your industry. And I think we will be back next year, of course. We will have the next review session actually in Shanghai, which I expect is going to be mental. So I'm very looking forward to that because there's going to be so many Chinese companies for us to talk about. So we have to do our homework accordingly <laughs> <laughs> and learn a bit of Chinese or Mandarin. Um, but thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening to us, of course, as well. If you have any feedback, any comments, if you want to tell us that a Hispano Suiza is in fact a great car please do that we're listening to you guys and uh, yeah so Eric yeah and a pleasure as always absolutely thanks yeah, for taking the time pleasure. always a pleasure I, these reviews are definitely like the highlight I love doing these uh, you know straight off the bat right right after we finish seeing some yeah. things and um, I mean Geneva like I said before is is my favorite show it's a great place to come and connect you know, unfortunately, some people don't have the luxury of coming on the press days. Yeah. But if you're a designer, period, just it's always nice to come out and to check out what other people are doing. A lot of people that are exhibiting, that are not exhibiting, rather, from companies um, that are not present at this show have come out just to see um, what it is that's happening in the industry that they're working in. And the proximity of the airport. If you're in Munich, you could come out for the day. If you're in London, you could come out from the day. Just get an early start, go back at night. The show is compact enough where you can walk around, do a quick turn, yep. and see everything that you need to see. And there are, like, pretty much every manufacturer here, save the eight that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, but it's definitely well worth the look. And, um, yeah, so be back next year. But right. we'll, see, uh, we'll see you from the next review from, from Shanghai. Exactly. And so for that, you will hear us in a couple of weeks' time for the next podcast. Uh, we will have a special episode coming very, very soon. Uh, that's just in about in editing. So enjoy that. Uh, thanks for listening once again. And see you and hear you very, very soon. Take care. See you guys. Bye.